Victoria Police Force presents D-24. From the files of the Victoria Police, for the first time come these true stories of unceasing war against crime, of day and night vigilance that protect our life and our property, and of the nerve center of the Police Information Bureau, D-24. girl was singing in my ear and looking in my eyes. It seemed that she was singing for me alone. She had a lovely voice. I wanted that voice, so I grabbed her. We conclude the true story of the strong man. a true story from the files of the Victoria Police. Only names, place names and dates have been altered. The young American soldier, Mark Novak, once the strong man in a circus, had killed a girl at Brighton only a few days before he met another girl called Vera. After drinking with Vera at a city hotel until nearly midnight, he escorted her to her apartment house a few blocks away. It was while they were saying good night that Vera began to realize that there was something very much wrong with this tall, good-looking young man. You gotta sing for me again. Oh, don't be silly. I gotta hear that voice. Good night, Mark. Sing for me. Please. Sing, sing, sing. Mark. Sing for me. I gotta have that voice. I gotta have it. You're mad. No, I'm not mad, but you gotta sing for me. Tomorrow night, Mark. I'll sing for you. Tomorrow no, night. Ah, you mightn't come then. Sing for me now. I'll come. I promise. If you don't let me go now. Can't let you go. I gotta have that voice. Not tonight, Mark. Yes, tonight. Go on, sing. Well, if I sing. A little. Will you let me go? Sing, sing, you know the song? It's, it's a lovely day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is a lovely day. Come and feast your tear dimmed eyes. On tomorrow's clear blue sky, sing, sing. If today your heart is wet, I can't sing anymore, Mark. I gotta have that voice. I gotta have that voice. It was a night watchman who, at five o'clock in the morning, discovered the girl's body on the steps leading to the front door of her apartment house. He immediately rang D-24, and homicide detectives were quickly on the scene. Mr. Brown, you, uh, you were patrolling this area all night, were you? Uh, th that's right, from about uh, nine o'clock on. Yes, and how often would you have walked past this apartment house between then and the time you found the body? Oh, about uh, seven or eight times. I pass it once every hour. Mm, did you notice anything that might help us? Not a thing. It was raining until about four o'clock, and then the moon came out. And it was the moon shining on something on the steps that attracted my attention. So I flashed my torch, and then I saw her. I see. There was uh, no one else about at the time? Not, not a soul. I thought she must have fallen down the steps, but when I went closer, I was pretty sure she was dead. Mm. 
So I went and rang D-24. Then on my way back, I found this bag. I reckon it must have belonged to her. Uh, let me see it, you know. Uh, uh, I, I had a look inside. Doesn't seem to be much missing, except that there's no money in it. I hope you didn't handle it too much and wipe off any fingerprints. Oh, no, no. I was very careful about that. Good man. And there's uh, nothing more you can tell us? Not a thing. But the handbag revealed no clues. The only thing the detectives had to go on was the similarity between this murder and the one on the previous Tuesday. And then their suspicions that a serviceman was responsible seemed to be confirmed when a witness came forward with what appeared to be valuable information. My name's Jackson. Yes, Mr. Jackson? I uh, saw something last night that might be useful to you. Yes? Well, I live in the same apartment house as that poor girl did, and last night at about nine o'clock I had to go out to post a letter. Mm-hmm. I couldn't help noticing an American soldier walking up and down the footpath just outside the front door. I didn't take much notice of him until I was coming back again and found him still there. I thought I might be able to help him, so I spoke to him. Yes. He said he was waiting for a girl named Vera. Did he indeed? Yeah. He seemed a decent enough sort of a chap. Said he'd had an appointment with Vera, but had somehow missed her. So he decided to come and wait for her outside where she lived. How long did he wait, do you know? No, no, I don't. Although he was there when I looked out the window about an hour later. Hmm. Yeah, he must have been very anxious to see her. Yeah, he was pretty keen about her, I think. Tell me, Mr. Jackson, did the man give you his name or anything like that? No, no, he didn't. I chatted to him about America for about ten minutes, but he, he didn't say his name. Uh, did he mention what his job was in the army or where he was stationed? Yeah, yeah, he did. Can you remember what he said? Uh, let me think now, uh... Yes, he said he was in a coastal artillery unit. Good. And the camp? He was in Area 3 at the American camp. Area 3. Well, that's fine. Now, um, can you give us any idea of what this man looked like? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. I had time to have a good look at him. And so the detectives raced to Area 3. And their inquiries led them to interrogate a certain... William Franklin. Do you know a woman named Vera? Oh, sure I do. Grandkid. Uh, when did you see her last? Well, I had a date with her last night, but uh, somehow we didn't meet up. Uh, you didn't see her last night at all? No. Nope. I waited around outside her place for nearly two hours, but she didn't show up. So what did you do? We well, came back to camp and, and bed. Uh, what's all this about, anyway? You've no idea? None at all. You don't know that Vera's dead? Did you say she... She's dead? I did. Yeah, but... But how come? She she was fine when I saw her last night. Uh, was, has there been an accident or something? Not an accident. A murder. Murder? Say... Say, you don't think I know anything about it, do you? Because I don't. You have reason to believe that she was murdered by a serviceman. Well, it wasn't me, buddy. You're on the wrong tram. You understand, of course, that we have to investigate every angle. Oh, sure, but leave me out of it. I'm afraid we can't do that. But I didn't do it. Would you be prepared to confront witnesses who say they saw Vera and the serviceman together last night? I'll confront anyone. Thank you. Well, if you'll get your cap, we'll go into town. But William Franklin was telling the plain, simple truth, and no one could identify him. And so the detectives were back where they started. But they persevered and interviewed two people who seemed to have quite decided views on the subject. I was at the hotel last night. I saw the woman with the soldier. Could you give us any idea what he looked like? Yes, he, he had fattish hair and was a pretty tall bloke. I served drinks to the woman and, and the soldier. Uh, could, you, uh, could you give us any idea what he looked like? Yeah, he had dark hair and was a short fella.
Fair hair, dark hair, a tall man, a short man. The detectives were up against a major problem. For where could they hope to find a soldier answering to these directly conflicting descriptions? And then the murderer did an incredible thing. It was the next evening, and he was standing outside his tent when his tent mate came up to him. Say, what's the matter with you, Mark? Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> you don't look so good. Well, leave me alone, will you? Sure, sure. Yeah, but you better get some sleep. You've been drinking again. Well, that's my business. I'm going out. You're going to bed. And now. I'm going out. Have some sense, Mark. You'll be in trouble if you go around the town like that. I'm in trouble now. Huh? I killed. I I killed. Oh, don't hand me that. I killed, I tell you. Say, you're even drunker than I thought. Get into that tent. No, I gotta go out. I... I killed. Are you on the level? Yeah. Well, who did you kill and... and when? Uh, I don't remember. I just know I killed. I guess we better go out for a while. You'll be telling the whole camp. Yeah, I gotta go out. And I'll come with you. Come on, pal. We'll take a ride into town. Well, now we're here. What do we do? Buy me a paper, then let's go eat somewhere. If you don't want a paper... Get me one, will you? Okay, okay. You wait right here. Here you are, soldier. All the latest news. Come on, let's see. Yeah, this place will do. Whatever you say. Table for two gentlemen? Yeah, yeah, two. This way, please. Here we are. Thanks. I'll send a waitress. Now, read me what it says in the paper. What about? The killing. I gotta know about it. You mean this dame they found on the doorstep? Doorstep. Doorstep. That's the one. Read it to me. Here. Read it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Give it to me. Doorstep. Doorstep. That's the one. That's the one I did. You're... You're kidding. No, no, I'm not. Here, you... See these cigarettes? They're Australian. They was... They was hers. I took them from her bag. I... I took a pound and a half, too. But... Why did you want to do these things? I don't know. I don't know. But I did, and they... Yeah, they found her bag. It might have my prints on it. Boy, you need help. You'd better get some. I don't trust anyone but you, and you wouldn't turn me in, would you? I... I wish you hadn't told me. I had to tell someone. You're the only one I can trust. I reckon you ought to turn yourself in. No. You could say you were insane or something. No, they wouldn't believe it. I reckon they would. I had to do a thing like that must be crazy. You ever hear of a werewolf? Uh-huh. That's a guy who turns into a wolf. What do you give me now? A jackal and hide. That's what I am. Oh, I know you're crazy. No, no, I'm not, but I'm two different people, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But I'm smart. How smart? I found a cap lying near the woman. Yeah. What's so smart about that? It wasn't my cat. I was wearing another guy's. But he might get the blame for the killing. He can prove different, but they won't catch me. I still reckon you ought to turn yourself in. No. You're gonna keep quiet, too. 
Aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, gu I guess so. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll keep quiet. And so Mark had, for some peculiar reason, confessed his crime and had exacted a promise of secrecy from his tentmate. The tragedy was that that secret was kept. In a few moments, we'll continue this true story from the files of the Victoria Police. This is a true story from the files of the Victoria Police. Only names, place names and dates have been altered. If Mark Novak's tentmate had not kept his promise of secrecy, Barbara Bates would almost certainly be alive today. But a little more than a week later, she was walking home in the rain and darkness near the vast park where Mark was encamped. Hey! Who's that? I'm... I'm sorry to worry you, ma'am, but would you mind if I shared your umbrella? It's mighty wet out here. Well, I... I don't know. I'm just going back to camp. It'll only be for a little way. Oh, well, I... I suppose it's all right. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am. Uh, here, let me hold it over the both of us. Uh, that's the idea. Let's go, huh? You're an American, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Have you been here long? Or uh, perhaps I shouldn't ask that. No, by rights you shouldn't, but... Uh... I don't imagine you're an enemy spy. <laughs> I'm not, I assure you. Did anyone ever tell you what a beautiful voice you have? I beg your pardon? I could go on listening to that voice for hours. <laughs> well, I'm afraid you won't have the opportunity. This is where I turn off. You're, you're not going. Oh, certainly I am. I live just over there. But I want to hear you talk. <laughs> Sorry. Just say something. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever am I supposed to say? Anything, anything at all. I just gotta hear that wonderful voice. I gotta have that voice. At the time, Barbara Bates was more amused than anything else. But next morning, her body was found in the yellow mud at the edge of a slit trench not very far from the camp. And with this, his third murder in a fortnight, Mark Novak signed his own death warrant. It was an Australian soldier who gave the police their first real lead. I, uh, I was on guard on a convoy of trucks in the street alongside the park last night. Yes? A bit after seven o'clock, an American soldier came out of the park just near where the slit trenches are. Yes. He was uh, covered in yellow mud, and well, I asked him what the dickens he'd been doing. And uh, what did he say to that? Well, he reckoned he'd got a bit drunk, and when he was trying to take a shortcut into the camp, he'd fall into one of the trenches. Mm. Was he very drunk, do you think? Well, as a matter of fact, I didn't think he was drunk at all. It seemed all right to me, apart from the mud. Hmm. Yes, uh, anything else? Well, uh, yes, he did tell me one thing, that he was camped in Area 1. Major, we want your permission to search Area 1. Go right ahead, gentlemen. No one is more anxious that these dreadful crimes be solved than we are. Would you like me to come with you? Yes, if you don't mind. Right, let's go. We'll go this way, I think. Then we'll be sure to cover the entire area. Uh, Major, this tent here. Hmm? What about it? 
Well, there's a smear of yellow mud on the flap. You see it? Yes, I do. And you'll notice that the mud all around here is a very different colour. It's quite black. <laughs> You're right, it is. Yes, we'd like to look inside this tent. Go right ahead. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Yes, there's uh, quite a bit of that yellow mud about, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. On the side of the bed. And there are traces on this jacket, too. Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. Still damp. Someone's tried to wash it off, I think. Does this mud prove anything? No, no, not at the moment. But uh, well, we believe that whoever attacked Barbara Bates would have got a good deal of yellow mud on him. I see. We'd like to talk to the occupants of this tent. This your jacket? Yeah. It's been in some yellow mud quite recently, hasn't it? Maybe. Yes or no? Yeah. How'd it happen? Well, there's plenty of mud hereabouts. Not plenty of yellow mud. There is around the edge of the park. Yes, we know that. So you've been around the edge of the park recently? Why shouldn't I be? Oh, the place where the yellow mud is is not very near the gate of the camp. Well, that's another shortcut. When did you last take that shortcut? Last night. Hmm. But uh, how did you come to get the mud so high up on your coat? Uh, I was drunk. I fell over. I see. Novak, we're investigating the death of a woman whose body was found on the edge of the park. I heard about it. Do you know anything about it? No, only what I heard. You can't help us more than that? No, I can't. Well, there's just one thing. Yeah? We'd like you to show us the spot where you say you fell in the mud last night. Will you do that? Sure. Why shouldn't I? Let's go there right now. And that's where Mark made his big mistake. Why? We'll tell you. Let's join him and the detectives at the edge of the park. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Right here, eh? Yeah, I... I fell into that ditch. Novak, you're quite sure this was the place? Sure, I'm sure. Can't you see the yellow mud all around the place? You know this is not the spot where Barbara Bates was attacked? I don't know where she was attacked. All I know is that this is where I fell in the mud. All right. That'll be all for now. You mean... I can go? Yes, you can go. Thanks. And the next time you're looking for a murderer, pick on somebody else. All right, Pete. Yeah. Just take a sample of this mud, will you? All right. And then rush it into the scientific section. Good. Get them to compare it with the samples from the tent flap and Mark Novak's jacket. <laughs> What's the big idea of calling me in again? Uh, sit down, Mark. I'll stand, thanks. All right. Mark, I want you to think very carefully before you answer what I'm going to ask. I'm thinking. Are you quite sure you fell in the mud at the place you showed us? We got to go over all that again. Please answer the question. Well, the answer's yes. Well, now, I have here... The analyst's report on the mud from that spot and the mud found on your jacket. So? The report is that they're totally different types of mud. Well, it couldn't be. It's all yellow mud, isn't it? Yes, it's yellow. But that's the only thing the two samples have in common. What are you getting at? The position is this. The mud on your coat didn't come from the place you indicated. No? Well, where did it come from, then? It came from the place where Barbara Bates was murdered. You're lying. I'm not lying, Mark. But I don't know anything about the murder. Are you prepared to take part in a lineup? What for? Three women have been murdered in a fortnight. Several people saw the man we believe did it with the victim. You're trying to put me in. I'm doing nothing of the sort. But we'll ask you to parade before the witnesses with a dozen or so of your comrades. 
and we'll see if you can be identified. There was sufficient identification for the police to arrest Novak, and he eventually wrote out confessions admitting the three murders. Legal history was made in Victoria when he subsequently faced a general court-martial according to the law of his own country. Nothing could have been fairer than his dramatic trial, much of which was taken up with the evidence of a medical board which had examined his life history in detail. His strange behaviour on many occasions naturally brought up the question of his sanity, but the medical board's attitude on this point was summed up in a few words. The patient is not insane, nor has he ever been insane. In view of this and his terrible crimes, Mark Novak's demeanour in court was remarkable. He treated the whole affair almost with levity, was always ready with a smile, a laugh or a wink at the most unexpected moments. But the weight of evidence was against him, and the court could only bring in a verdict of guilty, and his subsequent hanging brought a unique and tragic case to an end. The public, the police and a few lumps of yellow mud had combined to bring a dangerous criminal to justice. The great tragedy was that one of these women would not have died if one man, through a misguided sense of loyalty, had not kept to himself the things Novak had confided in, in him. This was one time, surely, when in the public interest a promise should not have been kept. And now let me remind you that your police force is on the job for 24 hours of every day, protecting our lives and our property. Let us be thankful for that, and resolve here and now to cooperate with them wherever and whenever possible. Only names, place names and dates were altered in this true story. It was dramatised from the files of the Victoria Police by Roland Strong, who now says goodbye until the same time next week, when there'll be another true story in this series, D24, which is brought to you by the Victoria Police Force and produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. <laughs>